So as you people know, it's very disheartening for me to watch the collapse of our civil society, of our republic. Imagine how hard it is for the people who really understand how against the foundation this is. Well, that's my next guest, James Walner of R Street, formerly of Heritage Foundation. He writes about Congress and the Senate, the separation of powers, legislative procedure, and he's an expert that we want to bring on to find out exactly how hopeless, if we are, and what our options are. I want to thank you for joining me, James. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. How's that for a lead-in, huh? I pretty much took up the whole interview. <laughs> James. It's, uh, uh, it's interesting times. Yes, these are. You know, and that's the one way to look at it. It's interesting, and I just started a movement where I'm revoking my consent to be governed, so it should be fun. As I am put into a concentration what? camp, you could tell your friends you were the last to talk to me. Um, well. You're following in the footsteps of some very illustrious patriots, although it's been a few years since uh, Americans were, uh, you know, did that kind of thing. So. If anybody could pull off a three-corner hat, James, it's me. But the reality is, <laughs> I mean, we're right back to this whole thing where we are basically, you know, this this is not just a banana republic election process. This is kind of the stuff they did in the 1800s where it was just shut up and believe me. And I'm having a real hard time with it, James. Is there any real recourse I'll tell you what, in the 1800s, it was literally you showed up and you just shouted out your vote. And if uh, people, they got you nice and drunk before you did that, though, as well. So, um, but, you That's know. I got married. Right? Go ahead. Yeah, for right now, there, there, are, there are rules. I mean, our state, our election system is governed at the state level. And that's both good and bad. There are pros and cons for all sorts of different reasons uh, for that. But one of the realities that flows from that is the fact that we now have, uh, I'm looking at Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, other places. I mean, Michigan's been called for Biden. But these states all have recount rules in place. They all have, uh, you know, those are the next steps. So, for instance, in Georgia, if you uh, if after the election results are certified, if, pres if the former vice president uh, Biden wins that state and within two days, two days of those being certified, uh, the Trump campaign can then, you know, file a petition for a recount in Pennsylvania. I think you only need three voters to do it. You only that's all you need. Um, so there are different rules in different states uh, that would govern the next steps if, in fact, um, the Trump campaign believes that there has been uh, foul play. So, James, less than 90 days ago, in both Nevada and Philadelphia, the one in Philadelphia, the court system, took over the voting rules and changed them without co cooperation or collaboration with the state legislature. In Nevada, the election board took control and changed rules. In both instances, I mean, you've got to call me silly, but I'm an old card player. Don't set the rules, and then after, after I win, you tell me, no, jacks were wild. To me, it's over with. Those two states change the rules, and those changes are illegitimate. Therefore, any vote that falls in that category is null and void. Am I just a stickler, or am I just a guy who wants to play by the rules? Look, that is certainly, you know, if that would be something that would arise under something separate than the recount provisions, but the Trump campaign could certainly seek a redress in the federal court for that. I'm a big stickler for the rules as well. That's one of the reasons why I think it's important that, you know, in the Senate, for instance, with Republicans, and they uh, pretend like there's no filibuster one day and then there is a filibuster the next. And I think that this just generally reflects uh, a deeper dysfunction in our society right now, which is that the rules don't really mean anything. And only thing that matters is whether or not we can get what we want, if we can win in this instance. And, you know, I think that's disturbing. Um, you know, and I think it's especially disturbing when you get into elections, because these elections are about getting the people that we want to write the rules. This is what self-government's all about. You know, James, I think so many people are so ignorant to how bastardized the rules have become and how corrupted our system is. I have this discussion all the time, and it's always been a concern of mine, and it's been one of the reasons I've criticized both Donald Trump and Barack Obama and George Bush and all of them. They have just something simple, if we can just let the people know. Something like an executive order, which was originally passed so that in wartime you could order supplies without having to go to Congress, has now become a weapon of law. And is it just that it's kind of like what I see with this election? Just shove it down the throat of the people, and sooner or later, they'll swallow. 
Isn't that kind of where we are with so many of the processes that were created to be a log jam? were created to be checks and balances. Now it's just shove it down the throat and sooner or later they'll swallow. Do you agree with me or am I off base? Yeah, yeah I, I don't think you're off base. In this fabulous country that we have, we have done something that nobody else in human history has ever done. I want to repeat that. America cracked the code of freedom. And the way they did it was by creating a space where equal Americans citizens could come together and argue and debate with one another and make collective decisions. And they created a system around that space that could not be conquered by rulers. We don't have rulers in America because our system is designed for us not to have them. But for that system to work, we have to have rules. We have to have institutions. We have to believe that if rule A says X, then that's what it means. And when you start to reinterpret then all of a sudden you throw the rules out the window and you can rationalize anything because all that really matters is the outcome that you ultimately want. It's a means to an end. Well, at that point, it becomes very impossible to sustain our system, our fabulous system, something that, we've, that no other people in the, in the history of mankind have ever come up with, our Constitution. It becomes impossible as for, for us to sustain that. And then we get into a point where maybe then you can have a tyranny of the majority. They're, they're rulers. You could have a tyranny of somebody less than the majority. But last time I checked, we don't have rulers in America, and I think that we ought to try to keep it that way. You and I agree on so much, and yet I'm reminded almost monthly on how little I can control. For instance, when Obamacare, in my opinion, which was unconstitutionally shoved down my throat through bribery, open and notorious bribery of senators, I kept thinking to myself, well, this will lose. There's no way they can coerce me into capitulation. Uh and it's a decade later, kid, and I'm, you know, 185,000 in premiums lighter, and it's still here, and it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. When, when and that's just the Democrats. When, when uh, uh, George Bush did the Patriot Act and wrapped that salad, and I'm cleaning it way up into a pretty package, I thought, well, this will never stand. That's clearly not constitutional. I have to be secure in my privacy and my papers and all that nonsense that we always believed in. The reality is, I feel the more, the more into the future we get, the more so-called advanced we get, the more we get pushed back into the past of just being subjects and, and servants. Am I wrong? Yeah, in, uh, no, I mean, in America, we don't have subjects. We're both, we, all, we aren't ruled. And I think that's an important thing for people to understand. I don't care if you're a progressive, a conservative, or anything in between. But, and, but we're know, here, and we're, you know, in, it's... But, and, and that's why I think it's time. I mean, Americans need to look in the mirror and they need to ask themselves, why are we voting for people who facilitate this kind of thing if we ultimately don't like it? Just as the late Justice Scalia used to uh, you know, say he had this saying, you know, he would tell the members of Congress when I worked on Capitol Hill, where they were like, are you going to strike down Obamacare? Are you going to strike down Obamacare? And he would say, why do you want me to do your job? That's great. Why do you want me? If you're funding it, you're funding this bill year after year, Republican congressman, Republican senator. You go out on the stump and you talk about how much you hate this law and how unconstitutional it is. Well, then why do you fund it? Why are you passing it? Why aren't you repealing it? Don't ask me to do your job for you. And I think that's fundamentally the breakdown that we see right now. Congress is missing in action. And, I, and again, this goes – I want to reiterate this point. It goes back to – it. It doesn't matter about your policy outcome. You can disagree with me, and I think you and I probably agree on a whole lot. Someone may disagree with us. But ultimately, we all need Congress for us to have an opportunity to try to win and create the kind of America where we want. And Congress is missing in action, and that's the problem right now. We expect our courts and our presidents to rule us instead. James, I want to get a little bit more in the weeds. I'm so happy you joined me. I know how busy you are. I do have to go to commercial. Do you mind hanging on with me? Absolutely. We'll be back with James Walner from R Street after this. James Walner, R Street, is also the author of two books, The Death of Deliberation, which he wrote in 2013, Timing is Everything, and um, Parliamentary War, which you wrote in 2017. Is that correct? Or 2018, maybe? Um, That's correct. So now that you see people like me, and I think it's reasonable to say, 
that with the rule changes, with the mail-in vote, with, you know, you got to forgive me, uh, James, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, where voter fraud is really an art form. Um, I have massive questions, and I want it to be done properly, especially when somebody like me also realizes what's at stake. I feel that a government that where the Leviathan gets bigger and fatter and stronger really is the death <clears throat> Now, in America, I, I think it's that serious. I think that we cannot sustain another real power grab of my civil liberties. Um, so I want this done right. Do I have any recourse or do I have to wait for the Lone Ranger? Because, you know, he never really shows up. And if he does, he's got a powder blue jumpsuit on. I don't really care for that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm an optimist. I try to be an optimist. And I believe deep down that things aren't as bad as they seem because Americans can change them at any minute, at any moment. And all that's required for them to do so is not some high-minded idealism. It's not all, of, you know, it's, it's literally trying to go to Washington with your elected representatives or to pressure your elected representatives to win to make policy, to craft policy in Congress. That's all it takes. And if people I don't like try to do that, then I would expect their efforts to win in Congress would then provoke efforts by people I do like to try to win in Congress. And we would have a big debate. And maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. But at the end of that debate, I'm going to be reconciled to the outcome. And last time I checked, the Constitution wasn't written to make me, James Wolner, happy. But for this to happen, we have to, again, I keep, you know, what you've said here is so important about the rules and how important they are. I met an older gentleman the other day, and he was talking about the act of voting as if it was a sacred act. And I'm not sure people care that much anymore. They care about the outcome of the vote. They care about what it could lead to. They care about the candidates that may or may not win. But the idea of voting itself being sacred is something I think that we're missing in our society today. And don't you think, you know, before you came on, um, I did my, my opening statement where I really do believe all of those things we were taught about the beauty of this country. I really do believe in it was the, you know, the country founded on the Enlightenment and that I am sovereign and that I am not to be ruled or coerced or intimidated. I believe all of that. I always did up until the last 20 years. And I've seen that just be infringed upon constantly. Constantly, and my my liberty, my my little ring of protection gets smaller and smaller, if not broken. Um, I do believe they need my consent. I do believe Abraham Lincoln understood that if you don't have the consent of the people, you really can't govern them. Do you think it that we still have an option to to revoke that? Is there an option to make people nervous by saying we don't consent to this? What do you think? Sure, I think the American people need to start. You know. You know, if you even go more recently when, you know, Bob Dylan's The Times, they are a changing song where he's like, we're going to rattle the windows and shake their walls. I don't I mean, I worked in Congress for almost a decade, almost two decades. There were no rattling windows and shaking walls most of the time, especially towards the end. Right. And so I feel like right now you can bring the pressure to Congress, number one. But then number two, you have to. You have to have a change in how you think about politics. Abraham Lincoln's a great example. His first inaugural, he talks about judicial supremacy in the Dred Scott case. And he talks about how we are, if the Supreme Court is the final arbiter, this is Abraham Lincoln, not John C. Calhoun. Uh, if the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of what is and is not correct and right and just in America, then we're no longer free. We're ruled by the Supreme Court. Well, right now, if you look out, that's where most Republicans and Democrats think. And what... I, you know, it's we see politics and we see Congress as a big factory, and all we care about is trying to control that factory. And so everything gets subsumed to that end. And then you quickly, when you arrive in the factory, to assume your place on the assembly line, I'm ready to go. I want to build my widget. And then you're told we, we want to build your widget. We love your widget, but we can't because if we try right now, we're going to lose control of the factory. And so, therefore, we're going to put that on hold. And we all buy into this. And so we end up thinking that it's about this outcome, this widget that we're trying to build, when in reality we never build it. And ultimately we stop participating in politics, which is the point of self-government. James, I have to tell you, I could talk to you for an hour. I really could. I'm up against a heartbreak. I want to tell you I'm going on an Amazon and I'm buying one of the books, if not both. It's my little thank you to you and i hope many of my listeners do and please when this is all over do you mind coming back because i think this is so important 
that people understand the principles, what their liberties are, and how they are supposed to really treat the people who say they represent them. Do you mind coming back? I would love to come back and don't give up hope. Thank There's you. always hope in this country. I love it. James Walner, R Street, and so many things. Please go on Amazon. Look at his books. Look at his articles. I so appreciate it. Thank you, James.